if I could turn back time. <laughs> oh man, you were perfect pitch, you Jonathan. Sing, that'd be perfect awesome. pitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's better right, than guys. I can do, Sam. <laughs> Brad is back. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. This is Choose That Five. All right, guys, back in the studio today. I took my stab at uh, karaoke live for you, uh, acapella, <laughs> and um, now that Brad is laughing at me, as are you, we'll hop into today's episode, but I think the theme is apt. We've been uh, taking a stab at this podcast for four years, four years, and there are lessons that we thought we wanted to share, but there's also lessons learned and things that we might do differently, and we thought we'd take a uh, just an episode to highlight a few of those for you and give you maybe some pertinent episodes to go back and re-listen to if maybe you're joining us for the first time. And I think maybe they might mean more to you now than maybe they did when they were first released. So with that, uh, and to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How are you feeling, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am feeling great, actually. I'm feeling wonderfully. Thank you for asking. We actually, it was funny, I got so many emails, like people, are you okay? Is everything going okay? I hope you're feeling all right. So uh, that was very nice, first off. But yeah, I'm absolutely fine. Uh, not sick. I certainly, you know, nothing, nothing terrible going on. I had a, a sleepless night because of some chest pain that was not, not heart related, thankfully, but, uh, I am good to go now. And I'm honestly, I'm feeling about as good as I've ever felt right now. So all's well that ends well. Okay. Awesome. Well, we tried to hold the fort down for you and I, I, Paul just brought it with the episode. So a huge thanks to Paul for, for kind of being flexible with us on that as well. Oh, uh, and I was so bummed to miss that. I felt I was trying to find a way. I was just like a zombie that day. I, I had not slept the night before. There was no way that I could have added. I would have only uh, taken away. So thank you for holding down the fort. And Paul, sorry I missed you. But it was kind of cool to listen to a Choose a Vi episode just as a regular listener. So yeah, bravo, Jonathan. Well, you thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, it made it easy because I did actually have a lot of questions. Because you, know, you know, I started digging Paul's content probably about I want to say nine to nine months ago to maybe as far back as 18 months back, somewhere in that range. I don't know why I picked nine and 18. I could have said one to two years. <laughs> no one would have called me on it, but, uh, for, for unnecessary, ridiculous levels of precision, uh, some arbitrary range. Anyways, uh, the episode, I had a lot of questions because frankly, Paul's thesis makes sense to me. It makes a lot of sense to me. And, and for people that have, have not listened to episode 290, so you can go to choose slash 290. Paul Merriman is known for what he uh, called the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. And the, the thesis that, that's embedded in this portfolio is that diversity is great. We, and it's exactly the same thesis as JL Collins' thesis. Diversity is great. So instead of trying to find the perfect company, let's just pick them all. But there's a slight nuance here. We'd like to, earn, we'd like to own relatively equal amounts of all the asset classes. So when you compare and contrast that with um, something like a cap-weighted index fund, like an S&P 500 fund or a total stock market index fund, where the biggest companies, uh, their market cap, you own a disproportionate amount of those, meaning the smallest companies, the companies that are still growing or not as valuable, you don't own as much. So what that might mean, the thesis would say, is that over time, you don't capture as much of the rise because a lot of small companies be eventually become big companies. They have to start small to become big. They rarely start out where they are at the finish line. And that sounds great on paper, but for probably 12 years, it has been basically the opposite. Apple and Microsoft and Netflix and Facebook and pick about another 20 or 30 companies you know, seem to grow Tesla, seem to double, triple, quadruple in value every single year and carry the vast majority of the returns. So while I do place a lot of weight in both the academic studies and uh, this theory that he's put out, this, this, this thesis that he's put out, it just hasn't manifested for 12 years. And so I just started right there because I know a lot of the people that have been following, you know, his work probably have that same sense in their gut um, that how much longer do I need to hold the face? So Brad, back to you, man. What were your thoughts or takeaways on the episode? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, obviously you are more of an optimizer when it comes to the investing side. So it was cool kind of hearing you dive into that. Cause I know that's what, that's what Paul is all about. But what's interesting, like his book, we're talking millions is really, it reads as like a five manual mm. when, right. When you look at at these small steps. And I do recommend that everybody pick this book up. It's, it's just like a really great high level overview of these 12 or 13 things that you can do that he, as he said, they're million dollar decisions each. 
and again, they, mm. they really do read as the best of the best of the financial independence community. So it's kind of cool to see Paul jump into this. And he's saying every one half of 1% you can make on your portfolio over a lifetime, it's worth 1 million or more. So each of these little decisions, but some of them aren't so little, right? It's save instead of spend. Start early, right? The earlier you can start, the more times, like I think of money as doubling, right? So like how many years do you have in your runway and your life ultimately for your investments to double and double and double, right? It's, we've talked about the rule of 72 and Jonathan, we can maybe talk about that. That's a little, little more specific. I talked about that in the five weekly newsletter that came out uh, this week, but it's essentially depending on your rate of return will tell you how many years it will take for your money to double. Okay. So you take the number 72 and it's just, it's, it's basically arbitrary. You don't need to know anything more than that, but 72 divided by your rate of return, right? So we say it's, we expect in, you know, in a, in a perfect world based on historical, obviously we don't know what's going to happen, but an 8% return. That's, that's what we, we kind of talk about here, right? At choose advice. So that means 72 divided by eight is equal to nine. Your money is going to double every nine years. So it's just really obvious when, when you look at that last doubling, right? If you've got 10 million bucks and it doubles, it's 20 million. If you've got 20 million bucks and it doubles, it's $40 million, right? So starting early is critical. Now this doesn't mean if you're new to choose if I, if you're new to just anything, paying attention to your finances and you're 40, 50, 60, it doesn't mean all is lost. I don't mean to say that at all, but today's the day to start right? And obviously we all wish we could have started at 18, but because you get those extra doublings. So, you know, it's just, again, a lot of these things, reliance stocks, not bonds own many stocks, not just a few cut your expenses. I mean, Jonathan, how many hundreds of hours have we spent talking about these precise things? It really is hard for me to overstate how much of a five primer this book is. It, it would be a great gift. It would be a great read for any of us. I mean, having now read probably somewhere between 10 to 20 books, you know, on or about or around, you know, fire related topics. Um, I was surprised at how much I just enjoyed reading this. You know, I, I knew most of the content just from, you know, obviously where I'm sitting, but, uh, but I was like, yeah, I would give this to someone. I would want somebody to read this book. I would, I would and, and to your point, you didn't immediately make that connection, but I know you were thinking it, uh, is that when we talk about these extra half percents doesn't seem like much, but is the aggregation of marginal gains. And now we've been able to quantify the value in this very specific case, each half percent improvement that we can make is an extra million dollars. Each half percent improvement that we can make is an extra million dollars. So if we can come up with 10 of these, we're, we're talking about $10 million over your investing lifetime. And the 10 are not like the, the, the 10 are all doable. You know, you may not do all 10 of them, but let's pick three or four and let's implement them early and aggressively and consistently over time. Okay. And when we've seen that, Brad, I mean, we we've highlighted in our own scenarios, just they weren't on this list, but they were tactics or strategies. And I think it's very similar. If we could turn back time, and I, yeah, we're starting where we are, but for an education perspective and for, you know, giving this information to people as quickly as possible, if we could turn back time and we could share with our younger selves, kind of our perspective on things now between the tactics that were in this book and what our own understanding, how our own understanding has grown and developed over the last four years, what would that conversation look like? Yeah, that's uh, that is a good one. So I guess we could do this micro or macro, right? So micro of the investing side, the money side and macro of just kind of life lessons, right? Things that we've picked up over these four years, maybe things that we might have known about. It could, it could be a bunch of things, right? Things we've known about, but didn't realize just how important they are awesome. or things that are just completely brand new that were blind spots to us. Yeah, I, that's that's what I would like to do. So I was thinking we'll take a we'll look at it through the lens of investing because that's where we started off, and then we'll scale back to or we'll we'll go back to a macro view and we'll look at kind of how our perception is changing and see if there's some additional things that we can do which we might not be able to quantify as half percents, but they have mat they're, they're massive inputs on this outcome. So starting with investing, when you and I came into this, and really for the most of the Fi community, the most powerful concept that we brought with us, not our idea, really inspired by JL Collins, is avoid the fees. 
Paul Merriman echoed the same sentiments. It's laced throughout uh, what he's talking about inside this book. Avoid the fees and diversity. Just buy them all. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't think that it has to be complex. Keep it simple. And the system works on your behalf. And Brad, many times you have quoted the case study of the individual that, you know, has the person that is doing all this for them. And that person is putting them into the expensive mutual funds or managed funds. So you have a, a, a management fund, you have an expense ratio, and then you have an assets under management fund. And each time you can eliminate one of those or reduce one of those, if you can reduce that by 1% on the expense ratio and maybe another half percent or so under the assets under management, I mean, we're talking quite literally millions of dollars for that individual over their investing lifetime. But then if they don't have a person doing it and they're not, and that person doing it isn't putting it into this, you know, brilliant fund with this person that's winning and, you know, knowing when to get in, when to get out, how could you possibly, you know, hope to succeed over the long term? And JL Collins kind of provided us you know, a North star for what that might look like if you understand the principles of time in the market is more important than timing. Yeah. And I think this is a, a critical topic and yeah, we've talked about this so many times that I, I don't want to sound like a broken record with my exact example, but somewhere on the vicinity of 40 plus percent of your total net worth will be lost to fees. If you put your money in with a financial advisor at 1% and a expense ratio of 1% on some mutual fund. So if you're expecting an 8% gross return from the market versus that 6% net after those two, those two fees that we just mentioned, you can expect to lose 40 to 50% of your total net worth just for that decision. So yeah, I mean, this is massive. When, when Paul talks about we're talking millions, it quite literally is many, many millions just from those decisions. And, and I think the biggest thing here is just that you get started. The reason JL Collins put the book together, The Simple Path to Wealth, we documented it on a very recent episode, uh, which Brad will provide that number in just a minute. I'm sure you can look that up. Uh, but, you know, his daughter, he couldn't get her engaged. And most of us, it's like, it's too complex. We don't understand it. How, you know, we're not going to, you know, how, how can we just, it just get started. It's literally just do it. Just trust the process and do it over time. Don't check your accounts. Don't check to see what the market's doing. Just make regular contributions over time. And if you can avoid the fees, you're already locking in return. Um, now we already just discussed how Paul Merriman adds some nuance to that. And we just talked about it in depth in this episode that we just passed 290. So Brad, what was the episode with JL Collins that we just did with him? The most recent one yeah. was episode 284. So we added some complexity and this is where we start to, and we're not going to spend the whole episode talking about these investment nuances, but I think right here, it's important to talk about some people that we've had on the show that have really helped us kind of expand things a little bit. So I would just like to add on to this Todd Tresseter, and I believe that's episode 52 it was an early episode. He kind of poked the bear a little bit and said, uh, complexity is important. You know, simplicity, it's, it's good enough as a baseline, but it doesn't accurately reflect reality and life isn't that simple. And you should kind of look outside of that. And that episode, it highlighted a few different things, but one of the biggest points that I think that Todd Tresseter talked about that I got a lot of value of was highlighting that there's really three different asset classes or three different strategies here. And you could invest in uh, paper assets, which is like the stock market. You could invest, you, you could invest in entrepreneurship you know, start your own business or real estate. But those are the three different ways that people make money. And that will, will, will extend this conversation shortly thereafter. But he also said inside of paper assets, specifically the stock market, complexity could be valuable. And he prefers complexity. And what's interesting about that is when you bring in two additional perspectives, uh, Big Earn from Early Retirement Now and Rick Ferry, both of who have a uh, wonderful credentials in the space. There's a balance in between the two, right? I mean, just because you love complexity doesn't mean you need to go for it. Big Earn and Rick Ferry both said most people will do far better just to stick with something simple that they can understand and that they can stay the course. That's the biggest thing. It's, it's the cake versus the icing. Everybody wants to focus on the icing. Everybody wants to talk about these different vectors and, and all these different strategies. But if you don't stay the course, then you're going to underperform the market over the long, the long call. And so how do you consistently, you know, keep up with the market? That's a strategy. And it goes back to something simple that will enable you to stay the course. And Brad, I think that's a pretty decent, you know, balance on this, on, on, on the, what we've talked about in terms of investing strategies. 
Yeah. And I think it's important to note that, that there certainly is nuance. I think sometimes people maybe get on us or the Phi community about just VTSAX and that's it. And that's not a fair understanding of what we talk about, because clearly, like you said, we've had probably a dozen different episodes talking about nuance. But I think what you hit on is is really important is that it's what is going to increase the likelihood of success for the vast, vast, vast majority of people. And I think for me, I've seen very few instances in life just generally, not just with investing, but just generally where where simplicity doesn't win. So, you know, Jonathan, I obviously, as I've discussed, I crave simplicity. And I think, you know, even when looking at the statistics and you look at people like Warren Buffett, who has talked about, you know, his estate going into a low cost Vanguard S&P index fund that he believes that's the highest likelihood of success. But, you know, you personally, have strayed a little bit from that. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Maybe, maybe that's the wrong term. Strayed. It sounds like you've done, you've done something wrong. No, but but I mean, you. I think you enjoy it, frankly, right? Like you enjoy learning more and there's nothing wrong with that. And you've come to the conclusion that, that with a certain percentage, and I, I imagine it's it's not an enormous percentage, but with a certain percentage of your money, you are not just doing the straight S&P 500 or total stock market index fund. Yeah, I mean, that's accurate to say. I wanted to bring more one more name into this fold because I think what I'd like to do is just share, like we just dropped a bunch of names, how I've navigated them. How are they all right? Like that, that that's kind of a that's kind of a thing. Like I've kind of in my own mind found a balance that works for me. And it's not dogma, it's not doctrine, and I don't expect anybody else to do it. But I but I think I am in the same position as the listener of having heard these people that have done a lot of research, respecting all of their opinions greatly. And not finding as much conflict as you might hear when you finish an episode and, well, one person did this, one person did that. Which one's right? Well, there is no right answer. There's what works for you. And I just want to share a little bit of my interpretation of kind of the path that, that I am going. So greatly inspired by J.L. Collins coming away with this idea that I crave simplicity and I, I'm not going to be able to, with precision over the long term, consistently find the companies, you know, and know when to get in or when, when to get out. Uh, so that was like, you know, index fund investing, avoid the fees, uh, which also made me more aware of index funds and also ETFs as well. Uh, that was kind of like a big light bulb moment for me. Uh, Paul Merriman really opening up the door to this idea that, um, I like the idea of, um, increasing at least with a percentage, a little bit of diversity outside of just cap weighted funds, putting a little bit more towards small cap and value, uh, big earn. You got to, you got to understand big earn has two audiences. Big earn is a nerds, nerd, nerd. When it comes to Excel <laughs> sheets, I still don't know how to navigate his Excel sheets, but big earn has two audiences that, that he reaches those that really like the extremely complex stuff, but then also recognizing that that's not the vast majority of the audience and he tempers it down. And so I find, I, I really appreciate his perspective and he, he may not, I may not line up with him 100%, but, but, but I find that like kind of use them as a little bit of an anchor to make sure I'm playing inside the lines here. Rick Ferry also, I like, he kind of takes a look at what JL Collins is talking about and what Paul Merriman is talking about, basically saying, these are both going to work. But if you, if you want to do what Paul Merriman is talking about, you got to be willing to go through some droughts and whatever strategy you pick, don't give up halfway in. Like once you pick that horse, stay with it because then you're just, you know, you're just going to, you're just going to lose. And we saw that again with COVID, what got crushed during COVID the worst Apple and Netflix and all those, they bounced right back. These value and small cap stocks, they got crushed 30, 40% and they stayed crushed. And we can visualize that. Small businesses are the ones that are hurting the most. So you got to be willing to, you don't want to abandon that in the middle. And that, that was a little bit of a wake up call for me to just in terms of how I, you know, uh, how I just assess my own personal risk tolerance. But here's where I want to pivot outside of this with two folds. One is Brian Feraldi. Now I had long sworn off individual stocks or at least I hadn't looked at them and I had just gone for index fund investing. But to be honest with you, if I, when I came into the show, Brian Feraldi, Brad, if you could bring up this episode, um, Brian Feraldi writes for the Motley Fool. He's been a frequent guest on the show, huge friend of the Phi community, and also a huge fan of individual stock investing, picking individual companies. And I got to be honest, I always conflated in my mind, it, buying individual companies with day trading. To me, and, and I've realized after talking to Brian Feraldi and, and looking at my own bias, they are not equivalent. They are not the same thing. One is doing your best to research great companies, recognizing that you as an individual investor potentially have advantages over large institutions and buying for the, for the long term. 
you know, making a thesis and buying this company forever, as opposed to, Hey, you know, I'm checking out the retracement levels and, uh, this one's headed for a little crash and we're going to try and buy it here. And we're going to sell it later on today, which is a train wreck, a disaster. And I always conflated those two. And after talking to Brian Fraud, he opened me up to the idea that, you know what, maybe I would like to have a small percentage of my portfolio allocated towards these. Again, I'm a responsible saver. This is becoming a hobby. I'm enjoying this. Um, I'm buying companies. I'm not buying stuff, you know, with this money and, uh, you know, try to make a couple of thesis and see how it plans out. And so these are just different directions that, that, that I have gone, Brad, I'll, I'll come back to you. get your thoughts on Brian's, um, individual companies as well. Cause I think that was an episode that really resonated with you also. Yeah, it absolutely did. And yeah, he was on originally in episode 75 and then again in episode 200, uh, he was also on episode 122R about dividends, but yeah, the two in question are 75 and 200. And yeah, I mean, for me, I think again, yeah, turn back time. So individual stock investing always seemed like a sucker's game for me. And I think that was just because I didn't know enough. It seemed like to your point, maybe it, it didn't seem like day trading to me per se, as much as just gambling or just buying little pieces of paper or, you know, they're not stock certificates anymore, but in essence, and just hoping you could sell it for X percent higher, you know, sometime in the future, as opposed to that fundamental rethink. And JL Collins actually helped inform this just with his entire concept of behind index fund investing is when you're buying an index fund, let's say total stock market index, you're buying a tiny little piece of thousands upwards of 3000 companies and everything those companies do, the hundred plus million American workers that are working for those 3000 companies, you're getting a little piece of all of their efforts, right? So that's the macro, but you can take the micro of, okay, I'm buying a piece of this one individual company. And again, I'm not just buying a piece of paper or a share on, on a computer screen. I'm, a partial owner of this company. And if I've reviewed all the fundamentals, if I see their vision, if I see where they're going, if I trust their management, all these things that Brian talked about, and I want to invest in this company, then, I mean, that's something that makes sense. And frankly, Jonathan, when we started this podcast, I would have said somebody was crazy for investing a significant portion of their money in individual stocks, because I would have said, that it would have decreased their likelihood of success over the long term, not increased it. And while I still think I would not advocate a huge percentage of your portfolio in individual stocks, I'm very open and willing to admit that I was wrong about the 0% that I would have advocated four years ago. And I think one thing that, uh, really helped me because you know, the, the, uh, the complexity of how I was building my own portfolio, uh, has been really within the last couple of years. And, you know, you just said you crave simplicity. I crave simplicity. I like to try these things, but I don't really want to maintain them after I've got them set up. And that all happened, uh, right around the time that M1 really came on the scene, M1 finance, which is why you hear us talk about it all the time. It's why we pursued relationship with that company. It's why I think we're talking with the CEO in a couple of weeks here. Cause it's just a remarkable piece of software that allowed me to have this complexity, but maintain it in something that felt almost as simple as once you had it all set up, almost as simple as the simple path to wealth. Um, but that ability to say, all right, well, here's a pie that I want to do some combination of what I'm talking about with Paul Merriman and JL Collins, this, you know, very diversified approach. And then in a separate little basket down here with a small percentage, of what I'm doing, this is effectively play money. You know, it is what I'm going to use as an experiment to invest in these companies, take some risk. If I, you know, if they, if they crush it, fantastic. I'm glad that I did great. If it, if I make bad decisions, then, well, that was a learning experience and lesson learned. I'm glad that I'm diversified. Um, the, you know, and I could add one more episode of this. We won't go a whole lot into that, but just Frank kind of, cause I'm not, neither of us, Brad and I, we're not in decumulation. Uh, bonds are not a significant part of our portfolio. And frankly, I don't have a lot of understanding of them. And so Frank kind of came on the scene and JL Collins come on the scene and shared a little bit with us, the role of bonds who might be interested, what type of bonds to look for, what are the features? Um, those are not something that are part of my investing strategy. 
personally, but I know certainly different people in the audience have got value from that. But what I wanted to come back to, Brad, is as we pivot out of this, going back actually to Todd Trusseter, Todd Trusseter said there's three different types of investments. And yes, paper assets are one on the stock market, but the other two, one of which I've still ignored to this day, and you have not, real estate is one of them. Uh, but the third one is entrepreneurship. And I kind of knew this because we were pursuing creating our own business with Choose FI. But over the last four years, I have become, and, and, and you were a little bit farther ahead of me at the time, but I become a full-blooded entrepreneur and I love it. I love the fact that you can double the value of your company over a period of time that you can put, you know, sweat labor in and you can create something of value. And, um, it is truly an investment that you have total control over. Uh, and so that is something that I don't think I appreciated as much before Todd Trusseter's episode, but I certainly have now. And it was amplified by the message that was really carried by Alan Donegan. You remember in episode 21, we barely talked about entrepreneurship. Alan called us on it and saying, this is massive. This is massive for the Phi community. This was my path to Phi. Don't you think it should get some, some credence? And we were so like taken back by that realization that we just, it was a blind spot that we kind of reworked our own framework for this conversation based on what Alan brought to the table. Alan Donegan, rebel entrepreneur. Yeah. It's interesting how that kind of all came together. Yeah. The pillars of Phi was episode 21 and we did not include entrepreneurship in the 10 pillars of Phi, which right now seems laughable, Jonathan. Right. But yeah, I mean, Alan reached out to us. That was the first time we met Alan and said, Hey, this is, this is a blind spot. And it's funny. Every time you talk about Todd Trusseter, I, I think about complexity, right? Like just even down to the language of paper assets, right? Like it's, <laughs> but he's not wrong. I mean, that's the thing. Like he, he couched it all in needless complexity in my opinion, but, but his message of those three main pillars, I mean, he's not wrong at all. It's the stock market, it's real estate and it's entrepreneurship. And I mean, I think that's where we've ultimately landed at Choose Up High. So Todd in way back in episode 52, again, I think probably a little, a little needless complexity with the language, but the message is spot on. And I think, yeah, you and I both, even though it's, it's funny, right? Like entrepreneurship was a part of my life for a handful of years at that point, but I still didn't consider it a main pillar of Phi. And I think real estate, if we talk about turn back time, right? Like I have mentioned so many times on the podcast how real estate is really, or at least in the story that I tell myself, right? Real, real estate investing was my biggest failure. And it was something that probably legitimately cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars in my, I made this catastrophic investing error in my, in my twenties. And in fairness, it was never real estate investing. That was the error. It was speculation. That was the error. So that's what I've learned. And that's the beauty of this, right? Is you learn so much about yourself. Like I put that out of my mind for so long and I just said, Oh, real estate investing is too hard. It's not something I can do. I screwed it up the first time and it almost destroyed my life, right? Like all these things. And by talking with people like Paula Pant and Chad Carson, I realized that this was my fault and I needed to take ownership of that right? It wasn't real estate investing's fault. It was Brad's fault for speculating. And I think what I came around to was real estate investing can be a significant part of my overall portfolio if I do it with investing at heart, right? Thinking about it as a business, not about, oh, am I going to buy something similar to what I was talking about with the gambling of, of the stock market? Am I going to buy something and hope that it goes up so I can sell it to some other sucker? right? That's speculation. That is essentially the definition of speculation. And that's what I tried to do with real estate until a couple of years ago when I, I decided, okay, I think I can dip my toes back in this. I think I can put my accountant's hat on and my entrepreneur's hat on and say, Hey, just look at the fundamentals of this as a business. And yeah, I mean, Jonathan, I, I said here on the podcast, probably, I think it's almost two years ago, that I, I did wind up investing in two single family rental properties. And, you know, obviously it's a pretty small sample size because it's only two properties and it's less than two years, but so far they've really been, been a, a nice success for me and just an overall positive experience. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to see, like if you would talk to me on January 1st, 
2017, when essentially we started Chooseify, I was saying there's no way on earth that I would invest in real estate. And it's, it's become something that I would contemplate augmenting as part of my portfolio. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So you truly are like, if we talk about diversification, uh, you're, you're maybe very simplified in terms of the stock market, uh, by design. Uh, but you've uh, diversified uh, into all three of these asset classes. So you have significant investments in paper assets and the stock market. You have real estate properties and you have multiple uh, businesses, entrepreneurship businesses. I mean, really, that's, that's it's it's pretty cool there now. And you didn't necessarily have all three of those at the beginning. You kind of worked your way through that. And I've, I'm, I'm experiencing a little bit of that as well. Um, and with the stock market and with entrepreneurship, real estate right now, I just don't, I don't have the bandwidth for it. I, I thought I was going to try, but I, but I, d- I didn't get into it, but the, you know, there's always time and you don't have to do everything, but thinking through what is your diversification I've learned, I, I really enjoy entrepreneurship. In fact, I've used, I've built a couple additional things, um, that are not necessarily relying on choose if I, that, you know, for me have been an additional form of diversification. So I put in work in, in a couple different ways. And I've just, I enjoy that process much more than I ever would have imagined even a few years ago, but I give a lot of credit to that, to Todd Dresser and Alan Donegan for kind of sparking that and, uh, you know, pointing me in that direction. I think a lot of this really goes back to, you know, Vicki Robin talking about, uh, what is your most precious non-renewable resource and what are you doing on this planet? Are you making a living or making a dying? And, and, you know, we, it's pretty obvious. Most of us would like to be making a living. So you got to view your time as that's your life energy. That's your most precious thing. So if we look at, you know, a few of the themes that we just talked about, that was in this kind of finite bubble of, of money. How can we optimize the money that comes into our possession to give us the best chance of success while maintaining simplicity so that it doesn't suck up every free second? Because when you decide to start adding some of the complexity that we talked about, there's a, there's a price to be paid for that. Usually your time, your and Brian for Aldi spends a lot of time researching companies, right? Big Earn spends a lot of time researching, uh, all these different things that he's the interest. He loves it. They're passionate about Todd trusted her. Probably the same thing. Paul Merriman, Rick Ferry, probably the same thing. JL Collins did, but he came to his conclusions. He trusts the process. He moves his attention onto other stuff, right? I mean, the, the simpler, if, if it is, it's not just good enough. It's more than good enough. If you want to use your life energy in other ways. Uh, and I think that's kind of something to, to keep in mind. Now, if I were going to turn back time, one thing that, that I, I it's, it, Brad, I know you've picked up a little bit on this, but I have, I, we all like, I'm trying to figure out how to say this the right way. Cause it's going to, it's going to sound darker than it really is. But a couple of years ago, uh, Don Wetrick quoted a CEO and Don does a great episode, but he quoted a CEO and he said, there is no they. And, um, I, I like, I love that sentence at the time and still like it in that it implies individual agency. You know, you, you got to control what you can control. It's time, you know, do what you can do. If you're waiting for someone else to fix something, you're always going to be waiting, be the change you want to see in the world. But the darker edge of my mind and the darker perimeters is more along the lines of it. There is a, they, and there's a system and they're trying to keep you down. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, some of us, and we've kind of talked about some of us starting from different places in life and maybe using the word privilege to describe that, you know, what is the starting line that you're starting from? But as I look at the system now, which I will just say is a, you know, is a real thing, whether or not we want to say there's a they behind it, there is absolutely a system that all of us are stuck in. And that system looks like we give up basically 18 years to the educational system. At the end of that 18 year stint, we usually come out with about 60 to 70,000 of student loan debt for which we then give, and maybe a profession, hopefully one that will allow us to pay that off in about 10 to 15 years. At the end of that 10 to 15 year window, we're now back to broke and we're finally starting to make progress with our investments. And maybe we do, but one of our biggest hurdles is that we have to be able to cover life insurance or not life insurance, but health insurance, health insurance at a thousand dollars a month, whether we see that or not, it's being paid for before by us directly or by our employer. It's a significant headwind. And then once you come to the end of that and you do have investments, you're afraid to leave your employer because then what are you going to do about health insurance? And then now you're in your sixties and they say you can have your golden years and don't worry social security, but every single year election, you're terrified that social security is not going to get a bump because there's been inflation or, you know, it's at the whim of, uh, of the political system. Like it feels like a freaking system. And so like, That's my darker mind. No one needs to engage in that or believe that, but that's my more cynical mind. And I think that the FI community in some way has said, 
speak truth to power. <laughs> and here is, if you want to break out of this system, this is the best possible way. And what does it look like? It looks like removing the unnecessary fees that are robbing every aspect of your life, realizing that you need to invest sooner. And then as we get more sophisticated at this, you know, for me, I'm like, well, what else can we do? What else can we do? Well, like, well, let's look at that 18 year educational stint. Do we really need 60 to $70,000 of student loan debt in order to succeed at life? If what I just said, the system is what success actually looks like. Do we really need that? Is it a false choice? And that's kind of where a little bit of my energy has been that I wasn't necessarily expecting four years ago that it is now like, is the 60 to $70,000 of student loan debt in a profession that four years from now, we're barely going to be able to tolerate. Is that really all there is? Yeah. It's interesting how many times we've talked about college on, on the show and, you know, we are not adamantly opposed to college as like a, an overall construct. I know you've become, you, you, you might be, uh, attending towards that just a little <laughs> bit, trending, but, trending. <laughs> but you know, I, I think, I think what you're really hitting on there is not necessarily speaking truth to power as much as what you said earlier, which is the agency, mm. right? When you have control over your life, the whims of society, the whims of whatever impact you much less. And I think that's a really comforting place to be. So I think that's one of the, the beauties of following the path to FI, just of saving money, frankly, is having options, having power, having agency. And I think as human beings, those are really critical, critical pieces to our overall life satisfaction and happiness. So I think that, you know, when you ask me, why would you follow the path to FI? I think that's it in a nutshell. That ev even if, even if you took it as saving money was deprivation, right? Which I don't take that at all. And Jonathan, this is, this is actually interesting because I think you, like you've always said, you are a natural spender, right? So you maybe in your perfect world would like to be spending more money than you currently do, but your overall judgment on what is the best path to lead to my best life? It's okay. Maybe I will curb that impulse a little bit because this gives me more power. This gives me more options. And that is well worth even that tiny little bit of deprivation, you know? So I think that is a perfect way for the natural spender. For me, the natural saver, like I'm not necessarily looking to spend more money except, you know, maybe at the margins here or there, but it still gives me those same results, right? So it, it covers that entire spectrum of, Hey, no matter where you're starting, no matter what your, your own outlook on spending money is in theory, you're getting the value of following the path to FI. And I think that's just a kind of a cool rethink on this. Right. And so I think that then comes to, okay, what are those things that are going to potentially hinder our path? to financial independence or that power and autonomy that we're looking for. And the sad thing is in this day and age, there are these systems that, that just in a perfect world would be blown up, you know, like in a perfect world, are people spending $50,000 a year on college? No, obviously not. To your point in a perfect world, are people spending more than a thousand dollars a month just on health insurance, not on health care, just on health insurance, right? Like you and I realize like, that we are business owners. That's what we, that's what we spend. We spend well more than a thousand dollars a month per family on health insurance. And then every dollar of health care is paid on top of it because you have a high deductible. So what you were trying to get at there is whether people know it or not, as part of their job, their, their health premiums, their health insurance premiums might be a couple hundred bucks a month but their company is paying it. So that's part of their wages, whether they know it or not, it's just not coming to them. It's getting frivolously wasted. So, you know, again, it's looking at systems and sometimes, you know, just the stark reality of life is this is the way it is. I need to understand how it is. And then I have to look at my range of options, right? So you can look at ranges of options from completely unpalatable, like, I'm going to, for me at least, completely unpalatable is I'm not going to be insured. Slightly less unpalatable, though somewhat unpalatable, is I'm going to move to another country. 
I love America. I have no interest in, in really doing that right now. My kids are very happy in there in their schools, but is that a 0% chance? No, obviously it's not a 0% chance. I would say for me, it's a 0% chance that we will go uninsured because I think that's, it, that opens me up to liability that I'm not interested in. Right. So I go through this range and then, okay, I could earn no money. I could just shut down my, my businesses, earn no money and then get subsidies. And then my health insurance is $0, Yay! but <laughs> yeah, but you know, <laughs> but then I, you know, I don't have choose if I, right? Like I, you know, so like, again, you go through a range of just what are the rules of the game? And I think that that's really Jonathan in a very tongue in cheek way. I'm trying to describe this is in every aspect of life, you look at the rules of the game, you survey the field and you make the best decision that's going to work for you. And I think, you know, that's, that's where, you know, you've hit on again, if you could go back in time. I think your college choices would be dramatically, dramatically different. And I think, you know, that's what you're advocating significantly with, you know, some of that with town stacker that you've created just in the last year. It's insane. I mean, we, we're going to actually do an interview with Anita coming up here. She was a student that just graduated from this program that we put together. Uh, and within 40 days, I think she came out of the hospitality industry, not to spoil her story. She'll better tell it, but hospitality industry, you know, everybody knows what's going on with hospitality in the year 2020. Uh, there is no hospitality industry. <laughs> I think she was laid off. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure on the details of that, but certainly was looking to pivot out, started the program, uh, w within a, just a couple months. I mean, she landed a figure that was like literally multiples of what she was making before. And she was talking to Bradley Rice, who I, who I, uh, created this program with. And she was like, literally angry that like the, the hospitality degree represented, you know, four years of education and massive student loan debt and gave her none of the skills that she needed for this job. This job represented, you know, two to three months of training, totally new industry, a investment of less than a couple thousand dollars. And she's making multiples of what she was done before. And, and it just struck me because that's not an anomaly. That's actually what we're seeing in this program, the Salesforce program that we put together over and over again. It struck me that like that, that is not probably the only type of program that is that, that could generate a result right this, like this, although I think it's probably one of the best ones that's out there, but we have lost our ever loving minds and forgotten like that, that skills are so much more valuable than degrees in demand skills are so much more valuable than degrees. We, we, we think it's the degree. In fact, we're willing to spend 60, 70, 80, 90, hundred, 200,000 for, for a degree. And then we graduate and we realize, unless we understand the skill that we possess and can communicate that to an employer, nobody's interested. Nobody's interested. So if we just flip that on its head and say, what is the high in demand skill and what is a great, you know, way to obtain that skill with ROI in mind, it then filters your selection and everybody knows, everybody knows this intuitively. I promise you, everybody in this audience, if you think about it for more than five minutes, the best way to learn something is to do it, right? Best way to learn something, fill in the blank, do it. We've all experienced this. You can hand me a textbook as much as you want. You can watch a tutorial as much as you want, but until you've actually done it, it doesn't stick in your brain. So why would you wait four to eight years and six figures of student loan debt to start doing something? Get in there and do it. So if we can build a system around that, we can completely eliminate the need. We can get, we can find jobs that are paying 60 to hundred thousand dollars a year, pretty handily. And instead of waiting four years to pull this off, we can do it in a period of months, not hyperbole. This was the, this was the hypothesis that Bradley and I posed. Is this replicable? Because this is exactly what Bradley had experienced. But Bradley Rice will have an episode number for you to talk about that. Then we tested it out with a program. And sure enough, uh, students were getting these results. And we, we told them, give us six months. Most of them were getting the results in three to five months. It was just, it was just unreal. And these, these income salaries are out there. So um, Brad, do you have the episode that we originally interviewed uh, Bradley Rice in by any chance? Yeah, that was episode 117. And then I think we uh, mentioned or talked to him in episode 239 as well. Awesome. And I actually started a, uh, a podcast really just highlighting this. And, and his is, uh, it's, it's called the Talent Stacker Podcast. And you can, you can really hear me, if you're listening to a podcast now, you can check it out. You can hear me kind of walk through what the strategy is and why it's important. You'll get to hear me rant and vent a little bit more. <laughs> but, but ultimately, what I would say is if you're like, that can't possibly be real, um, 
Bradley and I put together a free, like just like it's a five day challenge or it's a, it's a, like a, it's a, it's a, it's a basically an email course that just shows you why the opportunity that I'm talking about exists right now and why it's so powerful to access that. Uh, you can go to choose fi.com, choose fi.com slash Salesforce. It'll give you more information if you want to check that out. But that is, if I were starting over, if I'm 17, 18 years old, I'm going to go do this. I'm probably, I'm, I'm serious. I'm pro you're going to have a hard time convincing me to go to college. I don't know if I would have said that four years ago, I would have started to feel it, but not sure if I could buck the societal trend and do that because even four years ago, it felt like you kind of had to now, honestly, if I'm 17 years old, I'm going to go spend a couple thousand dollars. I'm going to do this program and I'm going to land a job paying 60 to $80,000 out the gate. And, you know, talk about a half percentage, you know, improvement. This is not a half percentage improvement. This one decision basically ensures that you reach something that we in the FI community called coast financial independence. The idea that you have enough money saved or invested by the age of 25, that if you never saved another dollar again, you would be well past most people, you know, well, you would have a net worth past what most people do at traditional retirement age. And it just keeps getting easier. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. It, it changes the entire game. Yeah, Jonathan, this this whole concept, you know, it's funny when when we do these segments on the podcast, like my mind is now just spinning out to if I could turn back time, right? Like, and I, I'm thinking about all of these other lessons that that I've picked up over these four years. I think we're gonna have to do a part two in this because you know, just thinking about like everything is negotiable, mm. right? And negotiating salary, like those are two lessons that we talked about a few times here on the podcast that I must have received. 200 emails minimum from listeners who actually took action on that. Like, Hey, I heard you guys talking about everything is negotiable. And that gave me the courage to make that phone call or, Hey, I listened to that episode with Tori Dunlap or financial mechanic. And I actually negotiated my salary and got an X raise wow. $10,000, $20,000 raise. Right. So, uh, those are things that jump to mind. There's a ton more about like maxing out tax advantage accounts that I wish I had done if I could turn back time. So, uh, yeah. Would you be up for round two of this? You know it, man. Yeah. You can find us every uh, Monday and Friday. That'd be, uh, <laughs> that'd be fun. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I hope you got value from this episode. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today and we will be back, uh, this upcoming week. And we'll also try to pick up this conversation about turning back time and just keep in mind, you know, for those of you that are more conspiratorial minded, and for those of you that are just like, man, there's some things about this world that just stink. If we could just fix that, everything would be better. Uh, either way, let us know, you know, send us your ideas, send us your feedback. What are the places to optimize that maybe you haven't heard us cover on the show? What are, you know, if, if there's a system that's been built, built and there's some unfortunate, unfortunate downstream consequences for those of us that are not questioning everything, what else should we be questioning? Send us your ideas, your feedback. We'll see if we can turn it into a show. In the meantime, keep questioning and keep looking for marginal improvements. You've got this. The fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.